Hello everyone and welcome to a new series that we are starting on the Civil Engineering Essentials channel which is talking about the structural design of a highway bridge. Now this is going to be a full series where I have a highway bridge and I want to design it from A to Z. Basically the superstructure, the bearing, the column, the pile foundation, the approach slab, the culvert and all that juicy stuff is going to be covered in this series. The, the highway bridge I have is a curved highway made out of pre-stressed concrete and it's going to be a box girder. So it's basically the most famous of bridges. If you have a curved bridge then usually use a box girder to carry this and the superstructure is going to be designed. The columns carrying this superstructure are going to be designed as well as of course the pines are carrying the column are going to be designed. The retaining wall, the approach slab, all this juicy stuff is going to be covered from A to Z. This is going to be one of the interesting series I'm starting the Civil Engineering Essentials channel. It's basically the creme de la creme, the magnum opus. I want Civil Engineering Essentials to be well known from this series. So basically I'll put my heart and soul in it. And this is something I, have, I was planning from day one to include in the channel. Usually bridges are taught in the confines of lectures where there is a lot of theory and not much not a real life application. The bridge I'm going to present here uh, in the next videos is going to be a real life bridge from A to Z. The full design process, so I'm pretty sure that you will enjoy it and that you will benefit from it. Now, in today's video, I'm going to give an introduction to the basic things you're going to do. Codes and materials and loads and so on. And you will notice that this video series is going to be in tandem. There will be multiple uh, theoretical lectures first, so that we establish some theory. And then of course there is modeling awaiting for you and design. We will be using a lot of softwares. I'm not sure if I will be using Robot or Midas, but of course you'll be developing our own Excel sheets. The best way, if you are watching this in the future, the best way to watch this video series is to look at the top right right now. I will be linking a link to the playlist of this entire series because there will be some lectures and some modeling. So I will try my best to sort them in a playlist in chronological order so dear hypothetical viewer from the future you should check out that playlist to see everything in order now please notice that there are a lot of things you should be knowing and there is a scope for this my scope is the structural design of the highway bridge the highway aspects of the bridge are none of my business meaning i am not intending to explain how the longitudinal or vertical and horizontal alignments were calculated nor the, the number of lanes and all that traffic stuff because my knowledge in traffic is limited my knowledge in traffic is simple average knowledge i just know it from bsc i'm not an expert in uh, highway aspects however i have a phd in structural engineering so i can call myself somehow an, an expert there and i will be dealing with the structural aspects of this that's the first thing the second thing is it's going to be as i said a box girder it's going to be a pre-stressed bridge we're going to cover pre-stressed concrete we're gonna cover bridge engineering bridge design we're gonna cover all this juicy stuff so it's gonna be really interesting and the bridge I have is a practical uh, project I cannot of course share all the documents but I can take outtakes for educational purposes there are some skills that you need to know for example pre-stressed uh, design and so on now if you don't know pre-stressed design relax I will be talking about the principles of pre-stressed design later when we reach that point so I will brush you up in case we need some help. Also, I will suggest to you the references if you need them. For example, a book by Antoine Norman, uh, Pre-Stressed Design is relevant, but of course that's too early for now. I will suggest the references when we need them. There is no real book. I have my own documentation for Real Bridge, so I'll be using that. Sometimes there are books and sometimes there aren't. For now, there is no book for this uh, video that I have today. Anyway, today I'm going to talk about the generalities of the bridge that we are going to talk about. I'm not going to show the bridge yet. I need, uh, this is going to be a uh, subject of the next video. For today, I want to establish the main framework of our design, like the loads and layout and all the things we need to consider. And that's it. That's what I'm going to do today. This is once again my magnum opus. I'm pretty proud that I want to tackle this issue and I hope you enjoy it. This is going to be a long video series, but trust me, it's going to be a complete video series and 100% free on YouTube. With that being said, sit back, relax and enjoy the show. Alright, so let's establish some things. First of all, 
I said this before, this will be the most comprehensive lecture modeling series you will see free of charge on the internet, so enjoy it. Uh, this is going to be the flagship of the Civil Engineering Essentials channel for years to come. Now, the design specification that I'm going to use is uh, I'm going to use the Ashto LLFD Bridge Design Specification 7th Edition. I know there might be newer editions, however, I have access to this, so I will use this. And there are some interims of 2015-2016, those are included. Now, there is a thing I need to say. I know that the CE channel tries to keep things code neutral. However, Highway Bridges is nothing like code neutral. It is code intensive. So I have to choose a code to deal with. Now, I have extensive knowledge with the ASH2 LRFD code, and I don't have much knowledge with the Euro code when it comes to bridges. Now, if you are not a fan of the ASH2 LRFD, well, you can still stick here because you can see a lot of principles. You might find uh, reflections to what we talk about in the ASH2 in your own code because there is like the strength one, strength two, serviceability one, serviceability two, fatigue limit states. So you might have their counterparts in your Euro code. So stick anyway, it helps a lot. The design life of our bridge, basically, that we are going to design is going to be 120 years. Uh, out of those 120 years, 40 years must be maintenance free. Uh, the 120 years is the life of the bridge before it needs to be raised to the ground. And the 40 years, first years must be maintenance free. Of course, in reality, it might not be maintenance free. What is meant by this is under normal circumstance, no accidents, no explosions or whatnot, it should be maintenance free. The design nodes we are using for the own weight of concrete, we're gonna assume 25 kilonewtons per meter cube. The wearing surface, you have an initial surfacing of 400 millimeters, giving you this kilometer square. This initial surfacing is done by 20 millimeter red sand asphalt. Uh, Google it if you want to check it. Waterproofing and two layers of wearing course. This is the initial surfacing now in the future you might make an overlay and this is 75 millimeters thick and this is also calculated there is also utilities and surfaces you might have drainage you might have electricity and so on this is assumed to be such and such one kin newton and those are taken from a real project it's not just something i made up sidewalks and footpath uh, I'm going to be made of plain concrete with this density. The unit weight of soil above the water table is 20 and below the water table is 10. Reason behind this is because there is an apparent uh, unit weight for soil submerged underwater. Uh, I remember this from foundation and soil mechanics that you would say gamma minus gamma water or something. So of course, apparently it is lighter. Now for the live, for the live load, we are going to use our trusty HL93 truck. Now this truck is Defined in the ash to code, you have those weights under the axles, and you have one constant axle and one variable axle. You vary those axles to produce the maximum uh, loads and moments. If you have a single span bridge, then usually we choose the smallest of those because it produces the maximum moment if you have smaller spacings and also produces the maximum shear if you have smaller spacing but when do you use the maximum spacing or any other thing rather than 4.3 you use it if you have a continuous bridge because you want to space out the wheels as much as you can to produce the maximum negative moment so that's why they have variables here now here um, the road that the the the, the truck load we're using is going to be multiplied by a factor of 1.85 this is a local requirement here and uh, it's like a factor of safety because look the ash tool code basically uh, provides you with the minimum design criteria and it is upon your discretion to increase sometimes if you have local authorities that tell you to increase or even by your own discretion uh, of course under the under the condition that you state that in your documentation and i'm stating right now that i'm using the hl93 truck and i'm going to multiply it by a factor of 1.85 and uh, there is also abnormal invisible loads uh, i'll come to that later at strength uh, two limit state this will be relevant later for now it might be gibberish for you Trust me, I will basically go through those once again when we reach them. For the wind loads, our design wind velocity is going to be 160 kilometers per hour. Uh, and for the temperature load, we have, of course, to include that because there is something called a temperature gradient. You might not see this in buildings, but in bridges because it's volumetric and you have a sun side and a shade side, you have differences in temperature. Our temperature range is going to be 60 degrees Celsius. Uh, the casting temperature is 30 with a rise up to 60 degrees and all the way up to zero. Of course, this depends on the region. You might have a region where you have less temperature rise and more temperature fall. 
you need to define those because you have temperature loads. Uh, the temperature gradient is going to be based on zone one as per the ash to LRFD with a construction load of 2.5. What is a temperature gradient? A temperature gradient defines how the temperature variates within the concrete, within the element. Like here you have the maximum temperature because that's the sun side. And you have here some temperature. It's not the sun side, but of course, the sun rays bounce from the earth up to that thing and heats it up. If you go inside the material, then of course the heat dissipates and the model of dissipation of the heat is what we have here in the temperature gradient. And it is this difference in temperature that causes stresses and this needs to be taken into account when you design a bridge. And we will come to that later. For the earthquake, we're gonna assume a seismic performance zone of one. Check out the seismic code for that meaning. I will come to that later when we reach this, when we start calculating. There is an ash to LLFD requirement for that, acceleration coefficient, so and so. The soil is going to be D with a big earmark telling you that you should confirm the soil using the investigation. And if something is worse than D, or even better, we should, um, you might uh, want to talk to the designer to modify his soil category. Now, in the region I'm working with, usually the window is what controls the design, but it's good mentioning that you should check the earthquake too and decide based on numbers the word of like saying oh my region is controlled by wind alone is not enough says who says me i am nobody what's uh, the numbers are the things you should check out so keep that in mind all right so for the concrete used you have a lot of concrete that are going to be used for the post tensioned concrete bridge deck you have c5020 now c5020 is basically a cube which is broken and when you break a crew cube you get a certain strength. If you try to break a cylinder, you get a weaker strength because I think the conversion factor is 0.8 or something. I forgot, but I think the conversion factor between a cube and a cylinder is 0.8. To be honest, I forgot. I forgot that because, well, uh, usually it's been a long time since I tested cubes. Uh, usually when you buy concrete, you just, you just call the manufacturer and tell him, hey, I want concrete such and such concrete such and such and he will provide it to you so yeah there's a conversion factor i think it's 0.8 i'm not really sure as far as i can tell i can i think i see 0.8 everywhere so for the post tension concrete bridge deck it's going to be a c50 over 20 or 40 megapascals precast concrete abutments you see all those things are parts of our project and all those things have different concrete strengths Worth mentioning is that we are going to use sulfate resistant cement for blinding concrete. Structural components constructed using aluminium Portland cement, such and such, those are um, things required by the local authorities. Now, chamfering, this is something that we usually do in bridge engineering. When you have a corner, you chamfer it with at least 20 millimeters. Chamfering is basically the elimination of a sharp corner via a chamfer. A fillet is also possible, but a chamfer is easier to implement in real life. You just have to put a triangular piece in your formwork and that's it. There's also the requirement to do construction joints or water stops. This is something we'll be talking about later. For the steel, there are two types of steel, the normal reinforcement steel and the tendons. For normal steel, it's going to be round deformed bars, grade 500 or more, splice, splice length needs to be calculated and the splices are staggered. Meaning if you want to splice all your steel, you cannot splice all your steel in one position because this causes a kind of weakness. You need to uh, stagger your splices. Don't splice everything in one position, just splice some of them. Like for example, 50% or according to your discretion, if you splice everything in one point, then this creates a weakness. To call out of steel, I think this is in the bridge code two. This is the number of bars. T means deformed steel, 16 is diameter, 200 is center center spacing, and T is the positioning with T being top and so on. So I think this is also taken from the British code or the Euro code even. For the splice lengths, you usually, usually provide on the drawings a pre-calculated table for the splice length for different concrete strengths. And of course, you have, this is I think class B. Uh, I forgot to write this. I need to check this out, but I think this is class B. If you want class A splice, you divide by 1.3. If you want to have class C splice, you multiply by 1.3. Those are splice lengths. Usually you provide this in your drawings. For the tendons, now this is where the new stuff will happen in the future. We're gonna have pre-stressing tendons for our box girder. Those tendons are cables. It comes in a strand. A strand is just a cable or a group of cables wound around each other. You know, the thing that you use to fix your steel. 
this round cable, of course, a different type, is used as strands. A strand is comprised of seven high tensile uh, wires that are wound around each other. The strength is at least 1770 megapascal. I remember the ash details, it's 1870. I'm saying here at least 1770. It's low relaxation wires. Relaxation means that, I mean, think about it. If you have a simple rubber band and you pull the rubber band and you keep it pulled for years, then you will notice that if you remove your fingers, the rubber band doesn't go back to its original length. And no, I'm not talking about plasticization. You are not pulling the rubber band too much. You are pulling the rubber band within its elastic domain, and yet it somehow increases in length. Relaxation is the opposite of shrinkage and creep in concrete. Concrete would shorten with time, and wires under tensile strength would relax with time. And relaxation is dangerous because it causes an increase in strain without an increase in stress, meaning it kind of unloads the wire, causing a loss in the pre-stressing force. Now, this is something that needs to be, it needs to be explained. The terminology and the idea of losses on pre-stressing strands is a nightmare to calculate, and I will relax, I will guide you through it. Now, those pre-stressing tendons are not just cast in concrete, they are cast in ducts, usually HDPE ducts, I know those, I have worked with those, there are also circular ducts. So what happens is that in your concrete, before you cast, you lay out the ducts in a certain shape and a certain um, profile, I'll talk about later, and then you cast your concrete, uh, You uh, sorry, you, you put your strands, you cast your concrete, and then you pull the strands and grout it. Uh, I will talk, I will show you a video when the time comes, I will show you a video how you usually do this. Um, basically, when you put the strands, you need to grout them. The grout should have minimum compressive strength of 27 at 7 days and 62 at 28 days. That's a local requirement. And uh, yeah, that's what a pre-stressing strand is going to look like. For the concrete cover, well, you can take your code to check out the covers. I'm going to assume those covers. Those are more than what the code wants. That's fine, because remember, the code provides you with the minimum stuff. You can go extra safety if you need. And our bridge is going to be on Pine Foundation. So you see that we are kind of agreeing on the things that we're going to do in this project. Finally, for this introductory video, uh, I'm going to talk about the construction sequence. Now, this makes sense just by looking. When we construct a bridge, uh, usually we construct the foundation first and the substructure, then we install the bearings. We're going to talk about this later. Then we construct the in-situ deck over false work, and then perform pre-stressing. Uh, after the deck, uh, concrete uh, gains sufficient strength, because you cannot pre-stress concrete without sufficient strength, you would break it. Then you remove the form work or the false work, and you construct the rest of the bridge. Basically, this comes first, and then the accessories come after that. Now, a very important question is, why? Why do you construct the bridge first and the accessories come later? Well, because when you construct the bridge, uh, because it's an elevated structure with all those crazy things and an horizontal and vertical alignment, there is always a 99% chance that you will end up having a bridge slightly misaligned from where it is supposed to be. So your bridge is should be here, and in reality, it's just two millimeters or five millimeters away from the center line. And this is the tolerances that are possible. Now, how do you fix that? Well, you do the approach slab last. After you lay out the bridge, then you just do your approach slab to kind of fix the problem. It's kind of a makeup, cosmetic, but uh, that's what is usually happening. So yeah, that's everything I wanted to talk about today. Thank you very much for watching. And before I finish, I want to give a bridge sized shout out to my dear channel members in the contributor level and the helper level whose names are going to be shown on the screen. I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart as their support for the channel is priceless to me and enables me to provide you with videos on time and with a certain quality I try to achieve. And for that, I am forever thankful. I hope that you enjoyed the video and you find it beneficial. If you have enjoyed the video, then please consider liking, sharing, subscribing, commenting, and so on especially subscribing because it increased the reach of my channel. As per usual, this is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel and we'll catch you in the next video. Bye-bye.